We thank you, Father Arsenio, for coming to speak with us, and especially to the Orthodox abroad. All of us have a need of a patristic voice and witness of the Holy Mountain and of our saints. We come to you because you have worked for many years within the Church with a faithful ethos as a child of St. Paisios and of all the fathers there who knew the saint personally. And we have great need to hear the voice of the successors of St. Paisios on these topics that trouble us. Well, I thank you for this opportunity to address the listeners and wider audience of our program here. You know, in the Patericon, it refers to an elder who says, I'm not an elder. Fathers, forgive me. I have yet to become a monk, but I have met many monks. This is important, you see, because a most fundamental and important guideline for Orthodox living is to follow the Holy Fathers and to obey the Holy Fathers. Obviously, it is good and important that the person themselves, whether priest, monk, or layperson, also has personal experiences but if we don't have any personal experiences, we follow the saints. But seeing we are of the Church, let me use a phrase of St. Paisios that we have all received some sort of quote-unquote candy, a taste of the grace of God, to be in this position that we're in. Otherwise, we wouldn't find ourselves here. The example is very important because we are speaking to Orthodox abroad who have come to Orthodoxy five or ten years ago and are still being taught. It's a different story if you've heard of or read about the saints compared to having lived with and known a saint. The difficulty for those abroad is to acquire the Orthodox ethos. It's very hard to get from books and sermons. One needs to experience the person. That's my experience when I travel to America and elsewhere. This is the big chasm. You learn the Orthodox dogma, the teachings of the Holy Fathers, etc. But to experience and live the ethos is very difficult. It may be a matter of purging, of catharsis, but that usually requires much, much time. For someone such as yourself and your fellow monastic brothers and the Fathers, these things are a given. They innately end up becoming second nature within you, most times without you even realizing it. That's why it's so important to give us whatever you can in this interview. But first, tell us a little bit about your monastery. When was it established? How did it come about? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, St. Paisius was involved in founding the monastery. Before I, I get into that, allow me to say to our Orthodox friends who have converted to Orthodoxy from a different faith, confession, that they have a great advantage over the cradle Orthodox born into the faith and that they can explore the spiritual treasure of the Church kind of with a, what we would say a virginal point of view, like in a pure manner. Because... Us cradle, we take things for granted, like Christmas, Pascha with our families, attending church services from a young age. But for those who come to Orthodoxy at a ripe age, they may actually evaluate and appreciate things differently. I think that's something positive, an advantage point. Yeah. <laughs> Our monastery of St. Arsenios of Cappadocia is located in Chalkidiki. It was founded by the prayers and blessings of St. Paisios, and truly that is a great blessing, but also a heavy burden, a good burden and responsibility for us. We started in 1986 on the eve 
of the Feast of St. Nectarius. The foundations were laid and then we opened in 1987, 34 years ago. There was nothing there before. With the prayers and blessings of St. Paisios, who was recognized as a saint long before his official canonization, and a great saint, must I say, not just for us who knew him personally, but for everyone. This was the general conviction, feeling everyone had. You see, the, the Orthodox have this feeling, an inner sensibility, better said, that is not reliant on rationalism or the intellect, but a sensibility where the grace of the Holy Spirit informs one's heart. So St. Paisios gave us the blessing to build the monastery where we built it, and when our elder, Father Theoklitos, said to him, But elder, we don't have any money. How are we going to build it? The saint replied, Don't worry. The people will see the cement mixer operating, and they will come and provide all the help needed. And truly, some being skilled in the trades offered their expertise, others their time, others donated bags of cement, others gave money, and we never had to worry about the, the future. Always with the prayers of St. Arsenios and St. Paisios, you see, we, uh, we regard them as two sides of the same coin. When man gives himself over to the grace of God, he can become an instrument of God's grace. There is nothing greater than to allow ourselves to become an instrument of God's grace. We didn't do anything special. Christ, the Theotokos, the saints, and especially Saints Arsenios and Paisios did it all. We just simply made ourselves available like conduits, being of a good disposition, voluntarily offering whatever little we could, whatever small we could. I would like to illustrate a story from the life of an Athenite monastic, Father Theoklitos of the monastery of Dionysiou. He used to say to the other monastics, Oh, what scandalous favor! Why did the Theotokos call us to her garden? Why did she choose us and not somebody else? How? Why? Are we any better? Holier? Or wiser? You see, that's the way one feels when their spiritual eyes start seeing. One says, O oh Christ, O oh Theotokos, Saint Arsenios, you honored us, you brought us to your monastery. If one begins to discern these things in their heart, not just emotionally, but you need to experience these things within your heart. Mere feelings alone are superficial and more external, but the heart is much deeper, as the patristic tradition teaches. A person must come closer and deep within the heart. Or as the Paterikon puts it, whoever has a heart will be saved. And you think to yourself, everyone has a heart. But obviously, it's not referring to the physical heart, but the spiritual. <laughs> so when the news starts being illumined, and you mentioned earlier of one's catharsis, cleansing, these are the goals of the Christian. Every Christian, and not just the monastics, some that aren't engaged much in Orthodox living or that are outside of the church, <laughs> sarcastically say, ah, prayer, the Jesus prayer, prayer ropes, and so forth. These are all for priests and monks. <laughs> That's incorrect. These are for everyone. We don't have two different Gospels, one for priests and monastics and another for the laity. It's the same Gospel and for all. And the goal is the same for all. Holy tradition is the same. The Holy Scriptures are always the same. But what may vary between the two is the frequency, the surrounding circumstances, and the environment in which one decides to work out their salvation. In all the years I've known you and during my visits at the monastery, I'd highlight that your monastery seems to have a very distinct, special, and particular character, which is very apostolic and missionary-oriented, but also equally very monastic. Yes, St. Paisios uh, used to say this. Please allow me to make another reference again to our elder Theoclito. Originally, he wanted to reside on the Holy Mountain, but St. Paisios would say to him, Father Theoclitos, it's good that some of you monastically reside elsewhere, 
than the holy mountain because the world has a great need. If all of you go to Athos, what will happen to them? They need help. We're not implying that we're something special here, as if we're going to save the world by doing this, by no means. But there's a different sense of consolation the Orthodox faithful receive in this. It seems that Elder Theokotos had that capability and drive. Yes, one should have the inclination, the drive, and calling in the broader context of undertaking missionary work. Usually the monasteries that are among the public do serve this purpose to a larger or lesser degree, especially the male monasteries. You publish materials, catechize, give public lectures, you go on missionary travels. Yes, we, we try to do all those things. I'm certain that St. Paisos approves your missionary efforts and is pleased and comforted by them. I'd like to believe so. I'd like to think so. I don't want to exaggerate here, but I believe that St. Paisios is the one saint of our age who has completely grasped the pulse, rhythm, and heartbeat of our times. He has fully encapsulated and understood contemporary men with all of today's problems and worries, especially in Greece, although the problems are the same everywhere. In the past, the saint used to say that a monk concerned with societal affairs, civil life, I mean, if he empathized and ached over the condition of society or politics in the broader sense, meaning the political and national climate of the time, not to politicize or campaign himself, how is it that I can remain afar and indifferent or sleep peacefully at night, me a monk, when I, my struggling lay people, my fellow brother is losing his house, his job, is hungry and has so many problems. How can I be at peace? I cannot remain indifferent. In the old times, if a monastic had this sort of interest and involvement, it would be frowned upon or considered inappropriate. Today, it's the complete opposite. One who doesn't agonize over and is indifferent or lacks the zeal and an interest over such conditions, it means that something is off, that there's something wrong with that monastic. Since obedience is the cornerstone of the monastic life, of course, a subservient or novice monk cannot just make up his own personal schedule and say, ah, I'll do this or that or whatever I want. Anything that is done should be done with the blessing of the elder, the abbot of the monastery. By this, it's ensured that there's a sense of security and a blessing in what I'm doing. God blesses it, and if he wills, it could bear fruit down the road. Let's talk further a little bit about, uh, a little more about obedience. Obedience is very important. It's the foundation of the monastic life and the Christian life in general. Christ set the example by being obedient unto death. It's a crucial issue in our day, witnessing the emergence of a foreign spirit, a contrary ethos entering the church, a different phronima, uh, delusional, heretical. The, the matter of obedience becomes a major issue. This raises a serious question for many of the faithful today. How can one properly obey when the orthodox phronima is absent in those who one is called to be obedient to? On the other hand, obedience is necessary for salvation. But on the other, we encounter this dilemma. So we ask, how do we interpret obedience? Is there a good, correct obedience? Is there a bad, false obedience? A misguided obedience? It's extremely difficult to grasp these questions for one who is entering the Orthodox Church now or just beginning their spiritual struggle, especially because in the Western world, Protestantism dominates. And the Protestant ethos tends to exalt personal autonomy and individual pride. As a result, an Orthodox bishop of the Western world will say, wait a minute here, this is dangerous to, enter in, uh, to entertain uh, the idea of a good disobedience. This would seem nearly heretical to most. So now one raises the concern of following the royal path, the avoidance of extremes. One is called to exercise discernment. How can one discern? The subject of obedience is of very great significance. Firstly, obedience is a spiritual discipline. As one makes spiritual progress over time, increasing in virtue and prayer, God pours His grace more abundantly, and obedience becomes easier. 
You can't practice obedience if you're negligent towards prayer and acquiring the virtues. You can't have one without the other. They're all links of the same chain. Obedience, prayer, spiritual struggle, struggling righteously with philotimo. This is the key word here, philotimo. St. Paisios always emphasized philotimo. Proper obedience can only operate in freedom according to our free will. So the spiritual father needs to be cognizant and sensitive of this. He shouldn't demand obedience, but rather let it operate within the realm of philotimo and freedom. Yes, yes, the soul will feel that. When there is love, you cannot pressure or demand from anyone. As they say, respect is something that freely needs to be earned. It cannot be demanded. Obedience within the church isn't like the army where the general gives a command and has to be obeyed. That's not how it's in the church. That becomes destructive. Yes, that destroys the person, the heart, the free will of the other. As St. Porfirios used to say, it has to be joyful obedience, not obedience that is forced. It's not something that's commanded to me. The purpose here is to do obedience freely with one's heart, whole heart. Another helpful story from the Gerondikon. Some monks said to their elder, we notice you especially love this one monk. Why? He said to them, come, let me show you why. He knocked on the door of one of his disciples and said to him, please, come to see me. He replied, I will, but didn't do it immediately. He then knocked on the door of the one he loved more, and the monk immediately jumped up, and the elders sent him to do a chore. He said to the others, come inside with me, and they entered the cell. On the desk, there was the, the incomplete calligraphy that the obedient monk was occupying himself with. He was about halfway through the letter, when without a second thought, he immediately rushed to obey his elder. <laughs> this is the type of obedience that pleases Christ. Joyous and free, with genuine respect towards the elder, and not an obedience motivated by fear or compulsion. This can be found in the teachings of the Holy Fathers, like St. Basil the Great, who refers to the different stages of the spiritual life, the bondservant, the paid hireling, and the free-willed son. It's not ideal to preserve the commandments or cultivate virtue out of fear or expecting to be rewarded, but rather like a loving son who freely obeys his father. Ultimately, this is the standard for healthy obedience. This is the standard. Something extremely significant that we read in the Holy Scriptures is Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they that watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. If the subordinate disciple feels that his elder isn't vigilant and watchful over the salvation of his soul in other words, meaning that the elder actually cares for him and loves him and isn't just a desensitized sergeant given orders. Sometimes this can hinder the disciple's ability to obey his elder. He just won't feel drawn as much to do so. And with the present circumstances relating to COVID and all the mandates, we keep hearing lately, obedience, obedience. <laughs> yes, they're telling us blind obedience. We are called to obey the church but first, we need to make a distinction between the administrative body of the church and essentially the church itself. There's a big difference. They are synonymized only when the administration of the church is in full concord and continuity with the teachings of the Holy Fathers. 
What do we mean by administration when the Archbishop, the Synod of Bishops, the Hierarchs, are upholding the teachings of Christ, the Holy Scriptures, the ecumenical councils, their decisions, holy tradition, the correct decisions of smaller local synods, etc., etc.? Only then does the administration become synonymous with the Church, and only then can the Church administration rightfully require proper obedience from its flock, meaning the lay people, all the faithful adherents, disciples, simple monks, novices, laymen, and generally all the Orthodox. I'm not entirely sure about the exact structure of other hierarchical bodies elsewhere, but in Greece, we have a small and a greater synod of bishops. The administrations need to rightly uphold and divide the word of the truth. Only then do the administrations have the right to expect obedience from the laity and monastics, which at such instance, even a simple layman or a monastic can receive divine assurity about such an obedience, if it's blessed or not, like a sense of inner confirmation or conviction, one could say. Now, let's relate the example of a military general and his soldiers. We see that even in the special forces, when a trivial situation presents itself, the chief general will lead the way. He will be the first to go across the lake, to tie the rope, always putting himself first at the face of every challenge in order to set a good precedent for the others. Not very long ago, what left a great impression on me was during an inauguration ceremony. The executive officer of all three branches of the special forces of Greece decided to remain unsheltered while it was raining so heavily, he refused to go under the tent and said, how can I and all of the other military execs remain under the tent while our soldiers are getting drenched by the rain? That's the right spirit. When I see that spirit in my elder, in my abbot, my spiritual father, the metropolitan, the patriarch, I get drawn by the right example in the Philotimo to obey. But when the leader just demands from you, do this, do that, to fight, to labor while he sits back, that doesn't inspire anyone. Of course, if you're in a state of dispassion or a saint, you may overlook these difficulties and the person and go work and do as they say, solely having your focus on Christ. But when we're still struggling and are spiritually weak, we are greatly benefited and strengthened to have such leading examples. But in serious matters of faith, we are called to access things differently. Obedience to Christ ceases to exist in such an error. Where there's a departure from the faith, Christ also departs from that person. Uh, the, the administration, isn't that correct? Correct. And this allows me to expand on the fact that the spiritual father must not make the spiritual child adhere to himself, but rather unite and direct them to Christ. Which brings us to ask, how can the spiritual child be united to Christ when the spiritual father does not uphold the faith or exhibit Christ himself? Yes, he has to exhibit the authentic Christ, and if possible, he has to have experience of the true Christ himself, or else, how can one point the way to a path which they haven't trekked or walked themselves? This reminds me of our former professor in dogmatics, the late Father John Romanidis, he greatly stressed that patristic orthodoxy is not an intellectual or theoretical pursuit, but an experiential science. In proportion to the level of, mm, please don't misunderstand me here, but for example, in order to become a good doctor, I need to be under the mentorship of an experienced doctor who knows what he's doing. How could I ever learn to perform a surgery if my mentor has never picked up a scalpel? Could he teach me to operate? Is this possible? Or in the military, if my commanding officer is unqualified or undertrained, how could he ever teach me anything? When someone isn't rightly upholding the truth anymore and he falls into delusion or deviates from the holy tradition that is established by the witness of the Holy Fathers, can we say that this, is a, this confirms a pre-existing spiritual problem from before that led up to the present fall? Because what usually precedes an even greater the descent from orthodoxy is a departure from the narrow path of obedience and virtuous living. This is the usual sequence leading to such outcomes. We're trying to understand the correct criteria, uh, pre pre presuppositions, and limits surrounding the application of obedience here. What's of interest here is recognizing healthy obedience, and when does obedience begin having boundaries? It can be difficult to discern its correct application at times, with so many innovations, challenges, and divisions today. When does obedience cease? 
and under what conditions under what conditions is someone called to obey or disobey as it relates to their salvation <clears throat> the holy fathers are very clear on this a disciple is called to obey unless their elder or spiritual father misguides them into immorality or heresy <clears throat> is heresy in this case only in regard to the dogma of the Trinity and Christology and something of an ethical moral nature or can heresy include something delusional that isn't quite as clear still deviating and leading astray how do we discern this and if the spiritual father falls into delusion what is the spiritual child called to do should one continue obeying someone who's fallen into delusion could they perhaps cast aside or ignore the delusion and obey and everything else? Is this possible? The spiritual child has the right, and I would actually say is obliged to disobey the deluded teachings of their spiritual father. And one might ask, but how will I discern what is delusion and what isn't? Well, every Christian receives a degree of enlightenment. And if one is humble and prayerful, God will reveal it to him. The spiritual child will disobey out of love. When he sees that his spiritual father has fallen into delusion, he will pray with much pain of heart and fervor. Then say with love, My sweet elder, perhaps you've erred. He shouldn't reprimand him in an authoritarian manner, but in a polite, respectful way. Let's say the way a loving Philotimo child would approach his father. Because we have pain, concern, and love, we pray that God will illuminate and resolve such situations. Mm. Υπάρχει το εξή δυτικό κόσμο και περνάει στου Ορθοδόξου, δεν νομίζω είναι εξ. But this, uh, in the West, they distinguish between capital T, holy tradition, and smaller T, just tradition in general. This idea exists that uh, small T tradition is of lesser non-salvific importance, so there's room for much variance and disagreements on the subject. This distinction may be helpful up to a certain point, but after it may actually create more confusion. Because a person might say, for example, that the tradition or particular teachings of how we behave in church isn't that important. Yes, but it is. Uh, is it unimportant? Or have the saints presented us with some precise instruction of how to conduct ourselves inside the church? Like, this is allowed, but that isn't allowed? This is a really big subject, but before I forget, let me mention what the Church's diachronic wisdom teaches us. He who errs in dogma also errs in ethos, in morals and in ethic, meaning that sooner or later someone who falls morally, ethically, may also fall dogmatically. The two are interconnected. We need to define what we mean by moral or ethical failure. Because in the West, something ethical or moral is something very specific. In Orthodoxy, however, it's broader, it's not as definite. Like making a superficial reference to a carnal sin, for example. There's a broader dimension to it. How can we define this ethos then? For example, in my past encounters with the blessed elder Ephraim of America, his face, his movements, the way he stood, the way he talked, his entire conduct exhumed holiness. It wasn't just confined by what he said or did, right? It was all of it together, collectively, that made up the ethos, revealing to us the way and life of Christ. And so here's the difficult part. How will we discern without having the appropriate... Let's say, for example, I draw the line here. I won't listen to my spiritual father anymore. He has erred, and therefore... He I'm presenting you with a challenging scenario so we can find a way to explain while trying to provide a criteria to help people discern for themselves because applying discernment is a personal practice. Right? Nobody can forcibly grab you by the hand and tell you, do this or that. 
We have to discover and apply the correct criteria. Yes, that's why the Holy Fathers tell us that the queen of all virtues is discernment. What is required from every situation, every moment, at different instances, etc. In medicine, for example, we're aware of this one principle. That which can benefit one person may harm the other. The greatest of all virtues, discernment. How do we acquire this discernment? Through spiritual struggle. The more one is illumined over time, the more he receives it. But we greatly lack this illumination today. That is why we should always exercise humility and ask others. That's why St. Paisios never did anything without asking. Let's say he would have an idea to go to Sinai, Egypt, or to leave the desert, or from Iviron's skit to Gorda Katunakia. He would ask first and receive guidance before doing anything. He didn't just do whatever he wanted. Within the Orthodox Church, everyone must have the humility to ask before acting, even patriarchs, everybody. <laughs> So imitating the example of the saints. Yes, Christ. Yes, of Christ. Christ, who humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. This is a very deep subject. I remember a priest who was ripe in age and virtuous with much experience. He was watching someone on TV who appeared to be orthodox, but truly wasn't. The priest was about 50 and his mother about 80 years old. At some point, while watching TV together, the priest made a complimentary remark about the preacher's sermon. The mother rebuked him saying, don't you see my child that this man is not orthodox? In other words, granny who wasn't even a priest or a spiritual father and with little education had the discernment to detect that this man was not orthodox from the way he spoke, how he presented himself, his prideful mannerisms, like her spiritual radar, for lack of better words, detected the falsehood. One can detect obvious pride, but what about that subtle hidden pride which isn't always evident? One needs spiritual eyes to sp spot it, and these spiritual eyes are usually acquired through humility. So, we're still dealing with the subject of obedience and discernment. In order to learn a skill, you need to apprentice beside a skilled master. So, to learn and acquire the orthodox ethos, you need to spend time with someone who is a living embodiment of this reality. That's why in many monasteries, it's very wise that monks of all ages should purposely cohabitate together. Meaning that you have younger monks of the ages of 25, let's say 30 years old, and then you have seniors who are about 80 years old that have many experiences and have lived a long life, attaining much wisdom, living together. This is a great deal. Let's say a, a young man who enters a monastery having certain expectations. For example, he begins having demands, asking for hot water, let's say. He only wants to bathe in hot water. You may ask, is hot water bad? No, of course not. Or may think that this story is insignificant or superficial. The person, though, who's more familiar with how the saints attract the grace of God, they start reducing their food intake, shorten their sleeping schedule, they minimize their comforts and luxuries, you see, the saints really knew something. They weren't dumb. Why would they choose such a route? Like St. John of the Ladder says that a monk is violent. Violent meaning spiritually forceful or vigorous. We fast. But why should we fast? If we're sitting cross-legged, stuffing ourselves, eating much, sleeping well, deprived of nothing, the grace of God will not visit us. Grace only comes, as the old saying says, he said, am I going to love his pnevma? Poor blood, spill blood to receive grace. Orthodoxy by its very nature is ascetical. 
So orthodoxy is experiential, but not in a mechanical or automated way. It requires personal effort, toil, and force to imitate the ascetical life. And that's not earned just by reading the books. We need to have a real-time connection with living witnesses of holiness today. I was impressed by something shared to me by a, a formerly heterodox man who eventually became orthodox. He said, I left from where I was because my former community did not require any sacrifice or struggle from my part whatsoever. Let's say I'm competing. I'm a competing athlete who wants to become champion someday, and I have a coach who doesn't challenge me at all. What good is he? I expect my coach to help me elevate my athletic abilities and standards. For example, if I'm lifting a certain weight, gradually, little by little, I eventually yearn to increase the weight. But if nothing is ever required for me, what's the point? What a remarkable observation made by this formerly Protestant man who is now Orthodox. I was never asked to sacrifice anything. And Orthodox requires a lot from us, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It should demand much from us, but always with discretion and philotimo, especially focalizing on philotimo and to set a good example in ourselves first, because how can we expect much from others without doing anything ourselves? <laughs> Oh,